Hey everyone, it's Dr. Namani and Dr. Louie back again today with the Athlete Spine. We're really excited to have two professors from the Thomas Jefferson University and the Rothman Institute here with us today to talk a little bit about uh, cervical stenosis and return to play, specifically as it relates to collision athletes. So we have Dr. Gregory Schroeder, who's an associate professor at Rothman and Thomas Jefferson, and Dr. Jose Canseco, who is an assistant professor, likely soon to be associate professor at <laughs> Uh, the same university. So thanks so much for being here today with us, guys. Oh my gosh, thanks, thanks for having us. Thanks it's our for the pleasure. Invite. Yeah, and I think if we think about why we even came together so quickly, is, is I, I think a lot of us were watching this game on Sunday night when we saw yeah. the Jets offensive lineman, right, Xavier Newman, didn't take a very big hit, but he just sort of tumbled over and then was not able to move his extremities on the field until he was essentially on his way uh, to the hospital for further evaluation, where they were then saying he was able to sort of move his fingers and, and, and make a, a, a gripping sort of motion. And, and all of us, you know, the four of us thought right away, well, this is probably a cervical spine injury. And if it is absolutely not a huge collision occurred, what would cause that type of injury? And, and you both were authors on a, a really landmark Delphi consensus paper that's been published sort of looking at this exact situation. So I guess I'll throw it up first to, to Dr. Schroeder. What, what was your initial sort of reaction when you heard about this story and what might actually be going on in, in Xavier Newman's? Story? Right. I mean, so obviously if you are a healthy 20 something year old uh, who has, you know, what basically is minor trauma and all of a sudden you're not moving anything, right? I mean, that, that's a terrifying event. Um, and the, the question is always like, well, did you have some kind of major fracture dislocation? Um, and then, you know, that's what you think about with really a serious spinal cord injury. Did not look bad enough that that could happen? Um, you know, obviously full disclosure, everybody, we don't know exactly what injury he had. Uh, but when you have a minor injury and you have, we call it uh, temporary paralysis, um, mm -hmm. it, it usually indicates that you've got some kind of pre-existing compression on your spinal cord and you basically have some kind of minor injury that for lack of a better word, kind of dings the cord. Um, but because there's not really severe pressure and there's not really a severe injury, fortunately that spinal cord is, is age, able to recover. So, you know, I'm just guessing is that he has some kind of either congenital stenosis, basically, which means you're born and the canal doesn't have a lot of space for the spinal cord, or you could have a pre-existing bone spur or something, right? These NFL players, their spines don't look like a healthy 25 year old, right? They're going to have a lot more arthritic changes. So they may already have something. So that my guess was that he had some kind of existing stenosis dinged his cord, but fortunately the injury wasn't severe enough. And that's why he made a pretty uh, rapid recovery. Right. And so, you know, and the news reports say that the MRI was negative. We don't really, you know, know what that means. Right. I mean, that, that all, all we know, uh, you know, is that, you know, probably doesn't have a fracture, at least we hope, um, you know, there's no reports that he had surgery or anything like that. But, but like you said, you know, uh, there's a fairly high probability that he had, you know, congenital stenosis, uh, that, that, uh, uh led to this, this transient quadriplegia or temporary paralysis type episode. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. There's not really a lot of evidence on how to treat these. Um, and also even if it's safe for these patients to play. So I know we're going to talk about the CSRS guidelines, which I, I think are really interesting, but I actually did a study before that where we dug through like a couple of years of the combine data. Um, and I mean, we consider an absolute stenosis less than 10 millimeters. There was a cornerback mm -hmm. who coming out of college had like 6.9 millimeters of space available for the cord, still got drafted, still played in the NFL. Oh, like, oh, wow. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but as a spine surgeon, if somebody came in and, me and had that, I mean, if they were a high school athlete, I would tell them, sorry, you're, you're not playing anymore. Yeah, right? I mean, but, I saw yeah, I mean, I saw in one of the figures in your paper, you know, that uh, that was a question that didn't have consensus on whether or not if you're someone who's going to be playing uh, professional, you know, collision sports, you know, like, say, American football, whether or not right. you need screening MRI ahead of time, right, uh, just as part of that workup, if you're otherwise asymptomatic. Yeah, and the answer was basically, no, people don't, I mean, it sounds silly. It's like, unless you have a major injury, people don't really want to screen everybody because they're concerned that they're going to have to tell people no. Right. So sometimes ignorance is just bliss, you know. And so Dr. Exactly. Tell, tell us about this paper. You know, these well, are I mean, you worked at the Cervical Spine Research Society on and like these collision athletes. 
Well, so this is when when I was a fellow, and and, and Greg was my my attending, and we came up with the with, with he was really the guy that spearheaded the the, the um, consensus study at the meeting in 2019. But but I think you guys touched on two points that I think are very important. One is the, this when, when um the signal changes, right? We're like, oh, there is no signal changes; it was normal. And I think that's one of the things that that Greg and I and 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 Dr. Vakar were like, well, this is an important thing to look at because T two signal changes are important. If, if he has a normal MRI, either. That's what they said. There's no fracture, or there's no there's no signal changes. And what does that mean? Well, T2 signal usually means hyperintensity, indicates trauma. There's swelling. There's inflammation. And you know, if this if there's are these changes and they persist, it's a more serious issue. So I mean, I was encouraged when I heard that there was no there was there was a normal MRI. But like like, like you guys said, you know, well, is it really normal, or does it mean that there's no fracture, right? And so that's one of the things that the paper touches on. Many experts that are the ones making the decisions, because it was not only CSRS. You know, we recruited the NFL team physicians that make those decisions for the players. They were part of the consensus, and and we use this this questions, this statements where okay, well, are signal changes important, and when they are present or not present, when do you allow them to return to play? And so and so that's the that that's the point that you guys touched on. And and, and the second one was well, you know. CSRS is a big society and 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 it's it's focused just on the on the cervical spine. But we couldn't do it without collision athlete uh treatment physicians, right? So so we could only we could send that and and use the data from CSRS, but we also had to have surgeons that actually treat those 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 athletes because otherwise it was irrelevant. So so that's that that's the, the strength of the paper is that we recruit many cervical spine surgeons, but we also have people that actually treat NFL and college level football athletes. So, Jose, I think one of the things that's important to kind of just talk about, just because I don't think everybody's going to know. So basically what this study is, was we it was basically a Delphi method. We did three different steps. Okay, so the first step was we sent out a survey to all of the Cervical Spine Research Society um, and we had, I'm going to say, like 40 or 50 questions. And then we basically took the results of that, uh, uh, toned it very much down to about 12 or 13 statements that kind of combined everything. Then we surveyed the Cervical Spine Research Society basically again, as well as uh, um, NFL physicians. And yeah. what I think you're getting at a little bit that I think is really important is there was actually a pretty dramatic difference in the CSRS uh, group and the NFL football group. But basically, it all came down to the two-level ACDF. Yes. So when you look at it, right, there was, a, there was a lot of agreement, right? If you have a one-level ACDF after surgery, everybody said you can go back and play. A hundred percent. If you have um, an injury where you have transient quadriparesis, like Xavier Newman, um, mm-hmm. but you have no spinal cord signal change, and you have, you know, basically... Um, more than 10 millimeters of space available for the spinal cord, almost everybody would let you go back. We said there was a strong consensus. Mm -hmm. But when it got down to uh, two-level ACDFs, it's interesting. uh, There was one specific physician um, who was a team physician who felt extraordinarily strong that they should never be able to play football again. Um, And then only about 50% of the um, NFL team positions would allow them to go back to play at all. Where flip it, the CSRS said they basically would treat one and two level exactly the same. So they yeah. had no difference there. And it's interesting. So we trained a lot of the military guys. So um, almost all of the Walter Reed spine surgeons are um, my former fellows anymore. And what they they will allow two level ACDFs to run back into full active duty combat. Wow. So the military treats them a lot more like one and two are the same. Uh, yeah. But at least in the CSRS guidelines, what we can say is one levels definitely can return. Two levels, questionable. Um, and then transient quadriparesis, I, I was shocked for somebody like Xavier Newman. The answer would be if he doesn't have continued spinal cord compression, almost everybody would let him go back. Yeah, yeah it's, it's And that's really, a key finding, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting the discrepancy between the CSRS general surgeons who probably are not, uh, for the most part, seeing a high number of football players in their practices right. and are mainly treating the weekend warriors and, and the regular population. And then the NFL, you know, surgeons who are basically see, who see these people, these, these patients, you know, and athletes on a regular basis. Right. Because I mean, just right. the, the forces that a typical human has on their cervical spine, 
you know, it's just not the same as an NFL athlete, you know, and then we can go right. more into depth on that. Like, you know, the difference between a cornerback and a kicker, right. Who both play, you know, football are also going to be seeing different forces on their cervical spine. Right. And so right, right, right. I guess it's, uh, you know, maybe not surprising that, that the uh, NFL, um, uh, NFL surgeons basically were a little bit more cautious, you know, given the, the forces that these um, players cervical spine see. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'll say what's interesting is they were more cautious about letting him go back after two level ACDFs. Uh, but when there's like the space available for the spinal cord, you know, that was in a thing that this um, NFL surgeons would actually allow them to go back more than the CDSRS, right? These are things that like don't necessarily fall into the paper. But to me, like a solid fused two level ACDF with no continued compression on the spinal cord, like, I mean, that's fine to me. Somebody who has like, you know, eight millimeters of space available for the cord and a 10 millimeter cord. Like I wouldn't let them go back. And they were like, eh, half NFL running backs look like that. I was yeah. like, what? It's yeah, just, I mean, that's the key. It's yeah. interesting that. I, I so. was just going to say that the key was, um, Venu, I, I don't know if, um, whether or not Newman has pre-existing cord stenosis. And the first thing I thought when I saw the injury was like, oh, I wonder if he this has happened to him before, yeah. right? Because a lot of it is like, is this the first hit or is this a recurrent second, third or fourth hit? And, you know, return to play gets affected by that. So that's the first thing I thought. I was like, well, if this happened before, it's going to be a, a problem for him. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if you guys know the answer, but he recovers so quickly that I'm assuming that this hasn't happened to him before. Yeah, I mean, and this is where the topic is really hard, right? Because everyone's yeah. always like, well, we need to research this more, right? We need more evidence to drive these decisions. But there's just not a lot of high-level collision athletes that suffer these injuries all the time that we can say, hey, let's have this huge study around them. And and you all have been part of, you know, the combine studies and, and Delphi consensus. And, you know, there's surgeons out there that are treating these athletes, but it's really hard to generate, you know, ongoing data on them where we can learn something specific from each case. And so that's why we sort of bring up the Cervical Spine Research Society. You've heard us talking about CSRS a few times here. And Dr. Schroeder, we didn't mention before, is actually the editor-in-chief of a, a really important cervical spine research journal, which is clinical spine surgery as well. And part of our field, you know, there's the clinical practice, but the diving into the why we do and how we do things better is so important. And we have one of our big annual meetings coming up, you know, focused on the cervical spine. Yeah. This population is so tough because we rely on a large number of patients to make these major decisions, but that is just not the case here. You know, right. Yeah. I mean, it, when you dig through the literature, I mean, you're lucky maybe 20, 30 people is like the case series. Uh -huh. And they're, they're, those are the huge case series for this, right? And usually you're looking at it and it's like, well, here's a, a couple of patients. And even if it's a case series, it's like, everybody is so different when you're talking about these athletes. Like how, how do you compare, right? Like you said, you know, a kicker and saying they're returning to play versus, you know, a middle linebacker. Like it, it's just going to be a, a different amount of pressure and different things that you're having done to your spine. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and I want, and and along those cases, is that this how physicians make the decisions of whether or not they can even play in the first place, right? Uh, in, in in the paper, we look at previous studies, and one of them, they're like, well, people that, that participate in the NFL scouting combine and they have a history of spinal cord injury, and that's why I was wondering if Newman had one before. They tend to have a lot shorter careers and play in fewer games compared to people that don't have that, and so you know. What what is the, the quarterback from Miami that now it says fifth concussion? Well, you know it's along the same lines. That this is a repeat offender, and then that you know long term viability to continue to play has to come into play as well. Yeah, right. I mean, I think it's not a contact sport, but I think T.J. Ford was a basketball player uh, who in the early two yes. thousands, right? I think he had a transient quadriceps episode when he played for Texas, yeah, and then cool. he got yeah. drafted. And then had one again in the NBA. It was like, I think he had surgery after the second one. It was like, I mean, like, if it happens once, it definitely can happen again. And I mean, yes. it's terrifying. And I remember that because TJ Ford, who was like one of the best college basketball players at the time. He had yeah, drafted, for sure. He got drafted really high. Yeah. Right? With that no He's hit. not in the league anymore, is he? I don't no, think no, so. No, no, no. Because he, he was like the early 2000s. Yeah. 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 
<laughs> yeah. But well, that's a great comparison. Well, I think, you know, you just, just given how, how few athletes there are that, I mean, how many, how difficult it is to perform, you know, our, our typical high level evidence types of trials on these athletes, you know, we really rely on these studies like you guys did, you know, these Delphi studies, uh, which provides uh, a, a way which we can gather a bunch of experts and try to make some, some good consensus decisions on how to, how to mm -hmm. manage this population. And I mean, I will tell you one thing that my patients love to hear, um, like non-high level athletes, is when I look at them and say, listen, you're having the same surgery that Peyton Manning had. And he played <laughs> yeah. in the NFL afterwards. I was like, yeah. so, you know, you don't have any long-term restrictions, live your life. And you can just see like the light bulb go off. It's like, all right, you're right. I'm not doing anything like that. All right. I'm, I'm not going to worry about if I'm on a roller coaster. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, yeah. I want to close this out with a, uh, a question for you both. So now three NHL athletes who I would also classify as collision sport athletes, for sure. cervical disc replacements. Would you guys ever do a cervical disc replacement in an NFL football player that came to you? Um, and, uh, or would it be position spe specific or no way? So if I were doing it, I would do it. ACDF. But so it's interesting. So there's three NHL players. Okay. So I talked about the military before the military will allow one level disc replacements to run back into full active duty combat. So I think that that's probably the closest that we have to like, um, an NFL player and they're allowing them to do it. And then actually I, I was on a panel with, it was kind of a worldwide panel. Um, and Australia and New Zealand let level disc replacements go back and do rugby, uh, all of that stuff. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think the honest answer is, yeah, once it's obviously integrated, it's probably not any less safe than a one level ACDF. Yeah. So Chris Weidman from the MMA, you know, he had a, he had a single level cervical disc replacement, right? Yeah. Went back to MMA right. fighting and people are trying to. Uh, I just had this discussion with one of my patients. Yeah. He's an MMA fighter. He comes from New York, came to see me. And 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 he's de he's debating whether two level ACDF or or one level disc replacement and and I said you know go and read the news and and you know there's they they they're getting disc replacements going back to fighting and they're doing well and I said you know if we if you do do the procedure I can't guarantee you that if you get hit in the head <laughs> that it's gonna stay where where I put it so so you know just just talk to colleagues and read and and then we'll do what you want but at the end of the day it's it, it would I recommend that you go back and fight probably not I agree with Greg I think wow. I would do a, a, a fusion oh no thank, so. thank you both for, for joining us today this is a lot of fun it's it's always sort of a controversial topic but all the fans know about it because they see it and then spine and spine. no right so scary to see so for sure. well thank you so much for having us it was absolute pleasure right. awesome guys thank you so much Phil. and i'll see you in a couple yeah. weeks absolutely yeah don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us uh on youtube and instagram at the athletes fine we'll see you all later